give a Mother's Day message uh, because there are certain holidays. This is a holiday for us. Holiday means holla is from holy, <laughs> holy day. And mothers that belong to God are holy mothers. Uh, they're set apart for God's service. And there are certain holidays that are just ridiculous, you know. You know, we don't celebrate uh, Halloween, for instance. You know, worshiping evil and darkness. And the Bible says, abstain from every appearance of evil. But certain holidays, like celebrating Christ's birth, Christ's resurrection, a day of thanksgiving, amen? Mother's Day, Father's Day, they're just so beautiful because they're very biblical. And we should treasure those opportunities. I've been blessed to have an uh, incredible mother. I don't want to embarrass her, but Thelma over there. <laughs> Can you stand up and just, and just, sing, just sing a song, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, Mom. I love you so much. I have a great mother. Uh, always there for us. Always, you know, bandaged up our, our wounds and... I especially like that she used Neosporum. She was ahead of the other mothers. They used peroxide, and the kids would scream, my neighbor friends. And I'd go, what are they doing to their kid? And my mom would put just Neosporum on. It, it, it was an advantage, too, because she had become a nurse, you know. And, and, uh, but she, in every way, even before she was a believer, uh, was a great mother, you know. And I'm also blessed to have a great dad. And if I ask my dad to get up and sing, I think he will. So I better be careful. Uh, <laughs> has a great voice. Uh, he's been a great dad, too. Always uh, there for us as well, you know. I remember a kid, a kid across the street, down the street, when I was just like five or six years old. Uh, no, you know what? It was a kid next door. He's like 10 years older than me. Mike Senna, good friend of mine, though, you know, later. But at that time, he hit me with a rock right in the eye and got a big black eye. And I came home all brave, didn't hurt. No, I was crying. I came home crying, you know, like, ah, oh, you know, a little kid. And I remember him marching out of the house. That happened more than once, his arms out, you know, and ready to fight for me. I'm like, no, Dad, you know. And, uh, and one of the houses, a couple down uh, over across the street, they were a boxing family. And I remember he went over to fight the boxing family, the whole family. I'm like, Dad, you know. Uh, but... Moms and dads who care about their kids are a big deal. And uh, we don't have as many of them as we need today. Many moms and dads are derelict. They spend more time on Facebook than they do with their kids. More time watching soap operas and watching their children. And that ought not to be, amen. So I praise God for godly mothers who really care about their kids and care about being great wives and and we have a, a bunch of godly mothers in this fellowship. Through the years, man, I've just been amazed, you know. And I could just start going through so many of them. And I have godly sisters. All three of my sisters go here. And our great mothers love their kids and, and uh, are sacrificial. And, uh, you know, absolutely amazing uh, sister-in-law, Gina. You all know Gina. Keep her in prayer. She's dealing with uh, brain tumor, cancerous inoperable, uh, but it just shrank a little bit more, thank God. Uh, so keep praying for her, and, uh, but what an awesome mom she is, you know, and I'd be remiss and in really big trouble if I forgot my wife. <laughs> now, she wouldn't say a word, but, it would, but she, she is an amazing mom, too. Just uh, to see her love for our kids all through the years and just being there for them. And, and even now, you know, with the grandkids, you know. And, and uh, just uh, awesome. And, and I can't thank you enough, baby, for being a great mom and a uh, great wife. So we have, uh, I mean, I could just, I could spend a whole message easy just talking about aspects of just seeing those motherly instincts that God's created mothers to be come out of her. But she has to make a decision, Right. Seeing her when everybody else is wiped out and tired and, and everybody's, you know, falling asleep or whatever. And, and then she's been up since early in the morning, get that, go into the extra gear and just clean the whole kitchen and do all the dishes. And, you know, and it's like, leave them for the morning, you know. No, I, I want to get them done. 
You know, it's just like a trip, you know? And I used to, I've told her, I said, it's weird how women are different than men, you know? I mean, if there's a noise outside, she'll be, well, I got to be honest, she'll be like, no, no, she doesn't snore like that. I'm kidding. She gets a little bit of sound going now, but not like me. <laughs> but I'm like up, pretty alert, bam. And I'm like, what is that? If it's an unnatural sound, I got a couple dogs and stuff to help and some guns. And ultimately, I have Jesus, ultimately I have Jesus though, amen, you know? But if the baby is whimpering and it's behold, below the threshold of my awareness when we were younger and our kids were younger, or the grandchildren when they spend the night, she's got that antenna that goes up. And I often don't even know it until she's getting up and, and you know, flicks a little light on in the hall. I'm like, she goes, oh, one of the babies was crying. I'm like, how'd she hear that, you know? It just trips me out. It's the way God's made us, amen? Guys wear pants. I know a lot of you women are wearing pants, but they're women pants, okay? Right? So uh, <laughs> where was that one going, you know? Uh, I haven't started on my notes yet, so that's when I could get in trouble, but I always try to stay biblical, you know? But I'll tell you what, man, we need to be who God's called us to be, and mothers are so needed, you know? I almost call this message calling all moms. Remember, like calling all cops or whatever? Because mo moms are so needed, it's really called a mother's prayer. And I want to talk about mothers, and I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be looking at a few different passages, because on a Mother's Day message, we want to hear from God's Word. That's where the power is, guys. That's where the transformation takes place. That's where God speaks to us is through his word. And in 2 Timothy 3, Timothy is where Paul tells Timothy that women shall be saved in childbearing. And many people misunderstand that text. I wasn't sure what that meant when I was a young believer. And, and it wasn't actually until years later because there were so many commentaries that said so many different things. that I was. It's just an interesting text. We know we're saved by grace through faith through what Jesus did on the cross. And I knew it didn't mean that they somehow merit their salvation. Some believe that, by the way. I met some people in Ireland or a group in Ireland that I observed believe that. Moroccan immigrants. And there's a lot of different beliefs about that verse. And I don't want to go into all the different beliefs. He'll be uh, saved through the bearing of the Christ child. That's not what it says. That's another view. That's not, the grammar doesn't support that. A lot of different views I go into, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. We've went through that text before. But it means that they'll be saved from falling away because they're chasing little Johnny and Joanne around and don't have time to speak to the serpent at the tree like Eve did, which it just spoke of who was quite deceived. Meaning they fulfill their role. It keeps them from becoming idle gossips, busybodies, de de denying their first faith and going after Satan. If you compare the term childbearing and that what Paul says to keep women from falling away later, a few chapters later, you see exactly what he's talking about. Women, you have a role as mothers that God's given to you, and that's to glorify him and to attend to your children and bring them up in the Lord. Amen? And as you fulfill your role and what God's called you to be, it keeps you out of the temptations that the devil would bring you along to go clubbing and partying and, and getting drunk and, you know, hanging out with gals that are not godly and, and ruining your life and ending up in hell in the end. But it's interesting. I think this pa there's a couple passages that show the role of a mother. We have a new mother. I can see right there from that belly. It better be a new mother or I am in really big trouble, you know, because that, that thing's pooching. How many months are you? Hey, good to see you again. It's been a little bit. Praise God. Eight months. Are you ready to go? How close? Okay, not less than an hour. Good, good, good. Praise God. Okay. We're with you either way, sister. But, uh, you know, it's interesting when you think of uh, First and Second Timothy, because Timothy is a young man who's on fire for Jesus. And the Apostle Paul is discipled in him. But what I love about this is the same books that talk about you'll be saved through childbearing, talk about the importance of the mother's role and how childbearing will help her to walk with God, also talks about the impact that a mother and a grandmother has upon her children's faith. Because you don't want to just bring your children into the physical world, amen? You want to bring them into the kingdom of God, amen? Amen. That's your main objective as fathers and mothers, amen? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. 
You, however, however, meaning, however, meaning in contrast to something else, and that is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first 14 verses, many of them which talk about, that's that famous passage which starts out in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of self, covetous boasters, on and on, disobedient to parents, without family love, without storge. And that word, without family, family love, often had to do with children who were disobedient and rebellious to their parents. And then, but Paul tells Timothy, a young man, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing whom you have learned them. Knowing from whom you have learned them. Verse 15, and who is that? And that from what? Childhood you have what? Known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Timothy knew the scripture from his youth, but he did not have a God-fearing dad. His mom was Jewish. His grandmother was Jewish, and they taught him in the scriptures. They obeyed the scripture which talks and emphasizes in the Old Testament scripture about the mother teaching her children, about being diligent to teach them. When you're laying down, when you rise up, when you're walking along the way, to teach them the word of God. I talked about before when babies were born, the first thing the mother would whisper in their ear was Yahweh is God. Jewish mothers so often. After I mentioned that one week, Whitney came up to me and she said, when my children were born, first thing I whispered in their ear was, Jesus is Lord. Amen? You can't start too young, man, from the womb to the tomb. And hopefully we go to the tomb before our children, but you want to be there the whole way through. Amen? And I love this because we find out that it was his mother in another passage and his grandmother. It says from your childhood, his mother and his grandmother. Grandmothers, you're not done. Amen? If you're a grandmother, you're still at work. Still part of your job. Not 24-7 anymore. Thank Jesus. Amen? Get some relief as in your older years. At least I get a little bit older. You know? Uh, and we're thinking, man, if we had kids now, 30 years from now, man, it would be really, really tough. 20 years from now, it could be hard. And it's interesting because we have grandchildren and I always, I didn't like it when people say, I love, because you get your grandchildren, you spoil them, and you just give them all kinds of chocolate, whatever, and, and then you let them go, and then you can, you, you just take a break. And it's, it's so nice. I hear that all the time. And there's some truth to that. I don't believe you spoil them and ruin them. If you're, you know, some grandmothers will just totally contradict what their children want for their grandchildren, and that's not, that's not good. But being there and loving them and caring for them, and then having a break, there's a sweetness to that. We've had Holly and the kids over for a couple of days. You know, her and Chad are in a big fight. No, I'm just kidding. That's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> Chad actually is at a wrestling tournament far away, you know. And uh, he should be back today, right, honey? Praise God. But kids need their moms and their dads as much as possible. Amen. I mean, it's crazy. When we have our grandkids over for a long duration of time, there's something bound. You know there's going to be something. And I went from my office. I have office here, but I have an office at home. And I went from my office to the kitchen. And there's little Justice, two years old, just two. And Eli, four. Just, they both jumped. And I go, oh, something is wrong. They both had that guilty jump, you know. They looked at me with saucer eyes. And it didn't take long. There's suds all over the floor. Suds on the, you know, the, 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 all over the front of the stove and on the top a little bit and counter and, and on the drawers, suds and water. And, and there's a, a little pail there for washing cars. <laughs> and I had come home, I think the day before, and little Eli was helping his mom wash her car and JoJo's car. She was nice enough to wash JoJo's car. I wish I would have taken JoJo's car. My truck would have been there. She would have washed that maybe. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. And, uh, and I just looked. And then Eli said, Pop, Pop, we wanted to clean your house, you know? He would say, you know. He said, we want to clean your house. And they pointed at Justice and said, Justice, but Justice made a mess, you know. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, one of the things with kids is one of the things we need to teach them is to take responsibility. Amen? That's a big one. Take responsibility. It's in our fallen nature to pass the buck, you know? And you don't do your children any favor by always blaming on the other kid. In fact, you're actually hurting your child immensely if your child can't do any wrong. Whenever there's a conflict, it's always the other kid's fault. I've seen parents like that before, and it breaks your heart. It's like kids need to learn to take responsibility. I mean, the Bible says if we say we're without sin, we're liars, and the truth is not in us. And if we deny reality that we need help, we won't see our need for the Savior. Amen? And uh, so it's important that we are balanced parents and that as parents, we face reality. Amen? That we're godly parents. I mean, in the very beginning... When the first humans fell, what did Adam do? He blamed Eve. He says to God, it's the woman you gave me. She gave me to eat. Then Eve was confronted. I mean, Adam was held responsible. God knew what's going on. Then Eve was confronted. She passed the buck. It was the serpent. He deceived me. See how that works? And a lot of times we like to blame others for the condition we're in, you know, and what happens to us. And and always blaming someone else or some circumstance and what have you. God says he doesn't give us more than we can handle. He tells us to choose life and death. He says, puts curses and, and blessings before us, life and death before us. He says, choose life that you may live. And he says, with every temptation and trial, he gives us a way of escape that we may be able to endure it. Amen. And there's no temptation that's overtaken us, but that which is common in other people as well. But he's faithful to give us a strength to endure these things. And, and we need to teach our children that we're all fallen. We need to teach them that we're weak, that we're made of flesh. We need to make sure that we don't say we're perfect. You know, we need to let our children know, yeah, I need Jesus, and I need him every day. They know that you're not perfect, but if you act like you're perfect and you've never made a mistake, that'll turn them off, you know? But they recognize that you pray, you cry out to the Lord, and, and so forth. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because I have two daughters and, and one son, and and from the very get-go, we let them know they need Jesus. We let them know mom and dad need Jesus. We let them know uh, how important it is that they acknowledge that they need Jesus. You need to let your child know that there's a real problem, what the problem is. Otherwise, they don't know the, so need, the need for the solution. Amen? You know? And by the way, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention my daughter, Holly. And I've watched her up close with her kids, and she's another remarkable mother, you know? Loves her kids, and she's got a third one in the way. Already has three kids. If you got a baby in your womb, you already have a baby. It's not just a, you know, quote-unquote fetus, which they interpret as being just a mass of tissue these days. We know better. But uh, we have so, such a calling. Mothers have such a calling. And look what Timothy's mother did. Taught her son, the scriptures from his, his youth. That way, when he became older, he knew what God required of him. He knew that God had a call on his life. Every child has a call on their life from the Lord. First and foremost to salvation. But every kid also has a call to ministry. I never told Jojo, you have to be a pastor when you get older. You're going to be a pastor. That's what, I, never, I don't know that that's God's will for him. I didn't know that was his will. So I didn't presume and say, you're going to be a pastor. That's helpful for a lot of pastors when they bring up their children because then their children get in the ministry and it's a very safe place. But I don't want my child, I don't want my son being a pastor if God didn't call him to be a pastor. I want to be whatever God wants him to be. Why does he necessarily have to be a pastor? I don't know. But one thing I told him over and over again is that God wants you to be saved. He wants you to know him. He wants you to walk in purity. And he wants you to be his servant all the days of your life. And you're going to serve him in ministry in one way or another if you're going to heed his call. Because God calls us to be saved, but he doesn't just call us to be saved. Amen? When he saves us, what does he do? He strengthens us. He purifies us. And he puts us in the service. You do recognize that every single one of us who are Christians, the moment we became a Christian, we were given spiritual gifts. Amen? You were given a gift, at least one. Every child that's born physically has physical strengths and weaknesses. 
But when you're born again, it says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, in Ephesians 4, in Romans 12, in 1 Peter chapter 4, each of those passages say each person has a gift. Some, many more. Paul said to pray for more gifts, 1 Corinthians 14. And when your child's born again, they're supposed to use their gift to God's glory. The goal isn't just to get your child saved and on their way to heaven. Woo, that's first and foremost, amen? That's huge. But you want your child to, ex- to realize they're part of the body of Christ. They're part of the kingdom of God. They're, full of, they're, they're, they're part of something bigger. And you don't get saved and do your own thing because that's not salvation in the scripture. Salvation is faith, and the word pistis so often means faithfulness. We're saved by grace through faith, but true faith, the just shall live by faith. But if he draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. So it's imperative that you teach your children that God wants to use them. The Lord doesn't want you to raise your child, and then your child, when they hit 18, they're gone. No longer serving God. No longer feel the need to be in fellowship and to build up and strengthen the very fellowship that built them up and strengthen them through the years to give something back to the body of Christ. Amen? You guys doing the studies, teaching the children. And by the way, thank all of you, men and women, who've been following motherly examples, whether you're father or mother or not, for teaching the children's church through the years. That's huge. That has a huge impact on kids. But we need to teach our children what God's called them to be. That's a big part of it is, and we need to teach them the word. Praise God, a lot of the kids know the word in this study, you know. I've had Sunday school teachers say, i got to be careful. There's a couple kids, I think they know the Bible better than me, you know. And he's, with, he's in the nursery with one of the girls. No, I'm just kidding. But I've had them say, wow, these kids are just, they know so much. It can be intimidating sometimes, you know. Um, but we need to teach up, bring up our children in the way uh, that they ought to go. And we need to teach them discernment. Every parent teaches their kid some kind of discernment for the most part. You need to teach them spiritual discernment. Because children are so easy to, it's so easy for them to get in trouble. If you have a sharp knife that they can grab, they'll be all bloody because they don't know better. A fork or something metal by a light socket We've seen that happen. I think, was it Holly? Which kid just got blown off the... Heather. Yeah, Heather. That would be Heather. (laughs) You know? Only because she's like me growing up. I always had to explore everything and learn the hard way at times. But uh, you need to teach them discernment. In fact, look at Hebrews chapter... Hebrews chapter 5. Now, this is talking about children of God, newborns. But there's a principle here. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. (coughs) Excuse me. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, meaning these folks had been Christians long enough where they should be teaching others, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not a solid food. God, through the author of Hebrews, is lamenting that there's people in the body of Christ who've been Christians for perhaps a few years or more, and they still need to go back to first grade. They still need to go back to the bottle and drink some milk. They can't eat solid food or they'll choke. And it hurts him. That means it's a child that's malnourished, that's And it's not the teacher's fault in this case. It doesn't appear it's their fault because he's rebuking them. You ought to be teachers by now, meaning everything was provided for them to become, to bring them to the point where they were affecting others with the gospel. They were sharing the gospel with others. They were teaching others and bringing them up and making disciples, amen? That ought to be happening at Blessed Hope, by the way. Hopefully you just haven't been learning for years. Hopefully you are imparting what you've learned to others, amen? But he's lamenting. And then he says in verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, meaning God's word. They don't know it as they ought. For he is an infant. Don't be a baby Christian for longer than God wants you to be a baby Christian. And none of us grow the rate God wants, his heart would want us to grow perfectly. But if you're a Christian for 15 years and you act like you're a Christian for 15 weeks, 
there's something wrong. If there's, a, if there's a grown man still in diapers, even though he doesn't have to be, but he chooses to be, and you see him, you visit him, how are you doing? And he's got a rattle and a binky in his mouth. Something's wrong. Amen? And do you know what? There's millions of professing Christians like that. They've still got a binky in their mouth. They can't even find for God so loved the world in the Bible. That's a problem. So we, as all of us, as men and women of God, we need to grow in the word, amen? We need to become accustomed to God's word. I mean, how many of you can list a bunch of football teams or baseball teams or hockey teams? How many of you can list 10 different kinds of beer, but you can't list the Ten Commandments? Huh? Let's not have a contest here. That could be really sad, you know? We need to be more conversant with God's word. Now look at this. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature who because of the, pra- the practice, because of what? Practice is something they do, something they spend time doing in our in. Have their senses trained to what? Discern good and evil. We teach our children, don't grab and play with something sharp. Don't stick metal in the light socket or the electric socket. We teach them basic discernment, right? We have to teach them discernment regarding spiritual things. We have to, the Bible comes down on the priest more than once in the Old Testament, the spiritual leaders, because they did not make a distinction between that which was holy and that which was profane. Profane is an interesting English word. Pro is a preposition outside of fane was an old English word for the, a temple, outside the temple. They didn't teach them discernment between that which was holy, dedicated to God, and that which was secular. And as Christians, we need to make sure our children know the difference. Amen? So they'll grow up swallowing every lie from the enemy. We need to teach them a distinction between who Jesus is and who the world's false leaders are, false religious leaders. A distinction between the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life. Amen? A distinction between God's pure word and counterfeits. Amen? We have to teach them all these things and bring them up in the way they should go so that when they're older, the scriptures say, they will not depart. We need to teach our children to be discerning. Now, there's a difference between judgmentalism and discernment. Now, the Bible does say, judge not lest you be judged. But the context is not to judge hypocritically. Because right after that, that's the most quoted scripture in the Bible by non-Christians. Did you know that? I see it all the time on forums. I'm not kidding. When somebody brings up, this is wrong, oh, judge not lest I be judged. It's the only verse most of them know because it's basically a shield from any kind of accountability. But right after Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged, he says, first take what? The beam out of your eye. Yeah, so you could take the speck out of your brother's eye. He doesn't mean ignore the speck. He doesn't mean don't try to help someone out. He doesn't mean... Don't make a discerning choice. He means make sure you're not having a big plank in your eye. That's, uh, I would not want a guy to do surgery in my eyes, a, a surgeon who had a big plank in front of him. That'd be kind of scary, amen? Destructive, actually. You're, don't be destructive. Don't be a guy that's like saying, hey, it's wrong for that guy. He's fallen into porn, but you're a drunkard. Repent of anything that you're practicing, amen? But then help that guy out of that whatever problem he's got, Amen? Because Jesus said, judge with what? Righteous judgment. Can you quote that with me? Judge with righteous judgment. That's a command from Jesus. We're called to make judgments as Christians. Genuine Christians who are really following Jesus will follow the whole counsel of God and obey that scripture where he commanded us to judge with righteous judgment. But in that passage, he says, judge not according to appearance. So many Christians, oh man, you know, did you see that guy? Can't be a Christian, you know? And they write people off. The Pharisees were like that, you know? But Jesus spoke of people that were going in the kingdom faster than the religious leaders because their hearts were right with God, amen? But so we're commanded to make righteous decisions. But when I say judgmentalism or judgmental, that, that carries the idea, that term carries the idea of being a Pharisee, 
and just being holier than thou, and I'm better than everybody, and having a snooty attitude, and, and wanting to show yourself better by criticizing other people, and being a, what I call a sin sniffer, you know? Just trying to find fault, fault finder, trying to find fault in people. That's not good. Okay, we want to love people. We want to affirm that which is excellent in others, the Bible says. Love hopes all things, amen? That's the kind of heart God wants to have toward other people, amen? And that's the kind of heart we ought to have. And when somebody criticizes somebody else, it's good to just throw a zinger in there and find out what's good about that person and say, you know, this person's been a real blessing in this way. Whoo, we talk about throwing something in. Now, I'm not talking about if there's something legitimate where somebody's being destructive and needs to be addressed and the person's concerned about the person or something like that. I'm talking about gossip, you know? And we need to teach our children not to be judgmental, right? Not to be arrogant, not to be Pharisees and self-righteous and talk about how bad other people are and how good they are. But we do need to teach our children to be what? Discerning. Because if your children are not discerning, they will be destroyed. My children perish, the Lord says, because of lack of knowledge. My children perish, the Lord says, because of lack of knowledge. Your children need to know the scriptures. They need to be able to discern between good and evil. Because he says here, but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to what? Discern good and evil. Well, God doesn't want you to be a judgmental Pharisee. He does want you to be a discerning Christian. And today in the body of Christ, Satan is having his way, encouraging the church not to be discerning. That's why false teachers flourish in our day. Oh, oh, don't judge. But wait, I mean, see that, that shepherd there? It's really weird. If you look really closely, you have these really long fangs and these ears sticking out of his deal. And, and he looks like a wolf because he's saying to drink this poisonous Kool-Aid. <gasps> You're so judgmental. No, we need to be discerning. Amen. The entire New Testament, almost every New Testament book was written to correct. I've said this before. Almost every New Testament book was written to correct bad behavior or false doctrine. And we're called to preach the word, amen? And to test everything according to thy word and hold fast that which is good, the scriptures say. If they speak not according to thy word, it's because there's no light in them, the scriptures say. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Believe not every spirit, the scriptures say. False Christ and false prophets will rise, showing great signs and wonders, doing, if possible, deceiving the elect. We need to be discerning, amen? See to it that no one deceives you, says Jesus. I can go on and on. We're warned over and over again. And right now, a large part of the body of Christ is deceived. There's a teacher online that's very, very popular named Todd Bentley. And he literally does these weird things and somebody comes up, he'll give like a, just kick them really hard, they'll fall over. God told me to do that. A person that's almost an influent. And the crowd laughs. Oh. And he goes off with his uh, wife. But no, I'm sorry, his secretary left his wife and now he's married to her and restored to ministry with his new wife, his secretary. Oh, and by the way, he said his new wife, he got a GoFundMe page or something, something like that. Just, I just read, that's why this is in my head, I just read it this week and it's uh, send a bunch of money to my wife so she can get some nice things, you know, on his Facebook or something. I don't know how many millions or not came in, but it's like, wow. The guy's already got millions, I believe, but he wants more. And if you work hard for your money and, and God blesses you because you're diligent and, and you work hard and you love Jesus, praise God. That's between you and God. And, and praise God for people that God's blessed because they bless others. Amen. And God wants to bless his children. Amen. As long as we put God first. Amen. But if you're fleecing the flock to get rich, it's a problem. So we need to teach people discernment when it comes to spiritual things, amen? And we need to teach them discernment when it comes to teaching. We need to teach your children discernment when it comes to uh, character issues, when it comes to moral behavior, what's right and what's not right. All these things are very important. And right now, your children need to know who they are more than ever, amen? You ever... Meet someone who has amnesia. I, I had a friend I was playing football with, and he got temporary amnesia, and it caused some problems for a little bit. But if you don't know where you came from, it's hard to know where you're going. 
And right now, society has spiritual amnesia. Satan's been very effective in what Darwin calls the devil's gospel, the theory of evolution, and he's tried to write off God so people don't even know that they're created in the image of God. So there's a total disorientation as to who they are, and they don't know where they're going. You need to teach your children they were created in the image of God from a young age, amen, and that they belong to God and that they're going to stand before God and that God's going to determine their future based on the decisions that they make here in this world. There's an identity crisis. I've been telling you that for some time. (sighs) MTV just had an award ceremony, and they awarded, uh, by the way, MTV's owned by the same company, same company that owns VH1, same company that owns the Gay Channel, okay? And I should say this, they got the same uh, general manager, and MTV says, we don't shoot for the 14, 15-year-olds. We own them, okay? And they're teaching our children. In fact, they just had a, uh, a gender-neutral award given out to Emma Watson on MTV. We should be gender-neutral, a lot of people are saying. There's no distinction between male and female. Satan would love to erase that distinction, amen? But God's made distinctions for a reason, Mothers make the best mothers, guys. Fathers make the best fathers. Studies show that, by the way. And Satan wants to blot out gender distinctions. And I'll tell you what, uh, by the way, Facebook, it used to have male or female, you know? Then it added things like bisexual. By the way, bisexual at least, and that's not a good thing, man, because God, males are to be with females and females with males, and that produces life in children. The others produce disease. It's pretty obvious. Anatomy is wrong. (laughs) The outcome is wrong. And the sadness it causes is wrong. But even the term bisexual at least implies what? Two sexes. Do you think about that? Now Facebook has over 50 different gender things you you can click. A gender. You don't have a gender. Androgen, I'm not going to read all of them, but I selected some of them, like androgynous, gender fluid, wow, gender questioning, gender variant, gender queer, intersex, male to female, neutroous, non-binary, which is like gender neutral, other, I don't know what other is, pangender, Miley Cyrus says she's pansexual, pan is a Greek word for Everyone, everything, you know. I don't know if that includes animals or not. Transfeminine, transgender, transmasculine, transsexual, transsexual female, transsexual male. Two-spirit, two-spirit. Like remember Prince? Changed his name, didn't want a name because he didn't want to offend the other spirit living in him, which is probably the spirit that was channeling all his music, a demon spirit. And that's what a lot of this is, guys. It's a... confusion. In some cases, it's just pure demonic. There's what the Bible calls unnatural affections. And when children don't have the armor of God, you need to teach your children to discern between good and evil, and you need to teach your children how to put on the armor of God. I teach, well, not justice yet about the armor of God, but Eli, about putting on the armor of God and what it is. And and I know it goes over his head, you know. But he's young, and you know how they're attracted to superheroes like for him, it was a little bit was Captain America, you know? And I always teach him the greatest superhero is Jesus. And, and the armor you need to put on because there's a real war. And he's four, you know? And I've been teaching him that since he's probably two and a half, three. And, you know, his parents do a great job teaching him. I just supplement a bit, and Lisa does as well. But I'm teaching them the armor of God. There's a spiritual war. And all of a sudden, people don't know who they are. You need to know what armor you're in, amen? You need to know who you belong to. You know how to put the helmet of salvation on in these different parts of the armor. By the way, this gender thing, and this confusion, and this whole idea about what I am, and that you could choose. You know women have an XX chromosome, right? And men have an XY chromosome, and it's encoded in your DNA whether you're male or female. Okay? 
If Bruce Jenner wants to walk around with fake boobs, a man putting boobs on doesn't make him a woman. It makes him a man with fake boobs. Do you understand that? That's the reality. If I said, hey, Lisa, I'm sorry. I hope you can accept this. I know you married me this way, but I feel like I'm a teapot, you know? And I had some teapot somehow melted to my skull. And I walked around with a bag over my head, but you saw the teapot. And I went around saying hi to people, and I just felt I was supposed to be a teapot and would pour tea, and I'd tell them I'm a teapot. <laughs> Do you think they'd walk around saying, wow, he's, he's, it's good to see he's found himself, you know? <laughs> that, you know, he's a teapot. That's so good. No, you'd say, the dude's needs help. When a super skinny, when a skinny gal looks in the mirror and she sees herself as 450 pounds, we don't say that, good for you. We say that's a mental illness. Isn't that right? Do not be jaded because a lot of the church is going to be sucked into this and already is. Right now, this is part of the spiritual war we're in. And by the way, discernment, it comes from learning the word of God but also comes from God raising up people to teach the truth. In Ephesians 4, 11, it says, God gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And he says different things to, to equip us so we're no longer like children. Remember, children don't have discernment. So we're no longer like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But that we're built up to stature of Christ. We become Christ-like. That's God's goal for you, to know you're creating God's image and to know that you're supposed to become Christ-like. Amen? For God works everything together for the good, for those who love him and are the call according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You need to teach your children that they're supposed to look in their heart like Jesus. Amen? And reflect him and allow him to strengthen them and live through them because they can't live the Christian life in their own strength, but to be empowered by him to be who they've been called to be, amen? See, you teach your children they were created in God's image, that we've fallen to own their sin, that's a reality to be humble and to treat others with humility because we're sinners and to walk in newness and righteousness and, and grow more and more to become Christ-like. The Bible says, without a prophetic vision, my children go astray. If you do not implant in your children from a young age a prophetic vision of who God's called them to be as part of his kingdom and part of the body of Christ and a servant of God. It's a lot harder when they're older to teach them that. Amen? But don't give up because there's reasons for hope as well if, you know. But I think it's critical that we understand that we are in a war. I was just reading about a guy recently from Argentina and he's transforming himself because he believes he identifies with elves and he wants to be an elf. I have my own beauty ideal, and I want to achieve that no matter what I want to have. My ears, I want to have my ears cut to become pointy, like an elf's, he already has. They're very pointy and tall. My jaw to look more sharp like a diamond, a facelift and an eye lift to give my eyes a cat-like shape. I am also uh, considered having a muscle implants true, too. You want muscles? Go to the gym, buddy. There is also a surgery to make you taller, and I will remove four of my ribs, too, so that I can shape my waist to make it thinner. I consider myself trans species. In the same way transgender people feel, I feel to, uh, to become how I feel inside. Over 25,000 bucks. Over $5,000 a month with facial creams and everything else to maintain that. Uh, and how many, how many of us are going to be paying our taxes are going to be raised because we, people are becoming trans this, trans that, trans species. It's going to bankrupt our nation if we continue to go there. There's your tax money already being used in prisons by certain prisoners that say, oh, I'm supposed to be another sex. Guys, we need to emphasize to our young men, to our kids, male or female, that they are male and they are female. There's four, five, six-year-olds whose parents are like, I think you were supposed to be a girl. A lot of times because they really always wanted a girl. Or I think you're supposed to be a boy. And then they make the girl a boy. And they start giving them supplements and then they give them sex changes. And that is wicked. That is evil to do to a child. How can you know what your child's supposed to be? Especially if their DNA says that they're a male, a female. Now the question might arise, 
well, what if there's a strange chromosome that's not either or, it's something you can't understand? Well, then there's some latitude. But when you have an XX chromosome or XY chromosome or your DNA says you're male or female, there's no latitude. We're hardwired. But these liberals deny science. They're science deniers. Isn't that ironic? They're denying the science of the DNA and the chromosomes because they want the philosophy of do what thou wilt. Be our own gods. That's what it's all about, guys, ultimately, really. That's what this whole thing is, is being our own gods and giving God the finger and saying, I'm going to do it my way. Well, you do it your way. Your life is very temporary. Then it's over. Then there's heaven and hell. Not worth it. Not worth it in this life or the life to come. So mothers, you play a huge role in helping your child accept their male or female identity and to grow in that and recognize their identity as being made in God's image and being made to know that they're supposed to know God to be saved and be made into the image of Jesus. You play a huge role. Absolutely, amen? And the prayer of a mother avails much. The prayer of a mother avails much. Remember Hannah? Praying for baby Samuel? She wanted him to serve God, remember? She was crying so much in prayer that Eli, he thought she was drunk early in the morning. She's sobbing and shaking, and, and she was just praying for a child. And God put him into service, amen? Remember Mrs. Zebedee? John and James were her sons. She went to Jesus and said, you know, when you come in your kingdom, you know, put my sons at your right and your left hand. She knelt down before him and cried out to him. Now, when I read that, I'm like, God, that's presumptuous, you know? And it, sometimes it bothers me. When I read that, I'm like, because there's all the other apostles, and I knew they had a problem of who was the best and stuff, right? And they'd argue about who's the best and everything. But I learned to appreciate things about that mother. You know why? Because she wanted her children to be in the kingdom. And she wanted them to be in a high place in the kingdom, serving Jesus. I thought, that's, that's a good thing, though. I'm not saying she went about it right or she wasn't presumptuous. I think there was a problem too, but I praise God. At least she's crying out to Jesus on her knees for her children to be part of the kingdom, amen? That's a good thing. Let's not lose that. Mothers, she was on her knees beseeching Jesus. Hannah was intense prayer. Get on your knees. Be involved in intense prayer. Men, men fathers too, amen? This isn't just for mothers. We'd be crying out for God. Oh, man, and who were, were her sons leaders in the church? Yes. Huh. They were leaders in the church. So prayer is a huge key. Uh, being a godly example, we'll get back to prayer in a minute too, but being a godly example, we look at 2 Timothy 3.15. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I love this. I just love it. This is some of my favorite passages in Timothy. Verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. Paul's writing to Timothy. I'm mindful, Paul says, of the sincere faith that is within you. He knows he's a sincere guy who has trust in Jesus. And then he says, which what? Which first what? Dwelt in who? Your grandmother Lois. And your what? Mother Eunice. And I'm sure that is in you as well. It sounds like grandma passed her faith on to granddaughter. I'm sorry, to daughter, right? And then grandmother and mother pass it on to Timothy. And then Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, look at this. The things which you have heard from me, he's writing to Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men, who will what? Be able to teach others also. Goes from grandma, to mom, to son, to other men, who will teach others, who will teach others. Mothers, do you realize the effect you have on the world and the kingdom of God through bringing up your children in Jesus? Huge. Huge effect. I've seen studies done of godly men and women and then their children and how their descendants just blessed 
the kingdom and, and led people to Christ through the years. And it's, a, it's amazing. You don't realize the good that you can do by just making sure you put Jesus first and you bring up your children in Jesus. Amen? By being an example. See, in 2 Timothy 3.15, it's about he, you learn the scripture that can make you wise unto salvation since your childhood. The word. Here, it's the faith that was in your grandmother and then in your mother is in you. Meaning it, their faith was duplicated. It's important that we teach our children to have faith. It's important that we demonstrate real faith in our own lives. It's important that they see you as a mother or father of faith that not just speaks the name of Jesus here and there but lives like a hypocrite but truly follows Jesus. We have to be sincere. I read about a father that got his son, he was getting his son ready for Sunday school for the bus to pick him up because the dad didn't go to church and the son was reluctant and didn't want to get ready and, and the dad said, hey, I was taken by a bus to Sunday school when I was a kid and then the kid quipped, it probably won't do me any good either. You know, that's a sad thing because they need to see Jesus in your heart. They need to see you walking in the faith, amen? I remember hearing about a story some time ago about a tightrope walker going across Niagara Falls with a big wheelbarrow. First, he just did it without a wheelbarrow. He said, how many of you believe I could do this wheelbarrow? Yay, yeah, do it, yeah, we believe it, yes. Walks across with a wheelbarrow, back and forth. People are like, yeah! How many of you believe I could do this with a person in the wheelbarrow? Everybody's like, yeah, 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 do it, yeah, you can do it, woo, yeah. Big crowd, whoa. He goes, okay, who wants to be my volunteer? Total silence. Being a person of faith isn't just saying, yeah, yeah, I believe you could do it. Being a person of faith is getting in the wheelbarrow. Amen? Is depending on Jesus, saying, Jesus, I trust you with my life to get me into heaven. Amen? And truly trust him. And having your kids see that you're trusting Jesus, but it coming from the heart, where it begins in the morning where you wake up and you be, say, Lord, I give this day to you. Fill me with your spirit. Use me to your glory. Help me to be a blessing to others. Pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Praying for your children, you know. And, and go ahead and make sure you lift up your children in prayer. Don't just pray for your own life. Pray for your children, amen? Make it a daily habit. I pray for my kids. I pray for my children, my son-in-laws, and and uh, future daughter-in-law, whoever she will be, you know. Pray for my grandchildren. I pray for Blessed Hope. It's pretty easy. Lord, bless Blessed Hope Chapel. Bless my brothers and sisters throughout the world. Give them strength. It's not hard to pray. Just do it. Amen? Be a person of prayer. Be a prayer warrior. Be an intercessor. But be an example. Be an example and get in the wheelbarrow. Let them see your example. Anybody remember when ISIS marched 21 men? Remember they were dressed in those orange jumpsuits? on the beach, anybody remember those images? To behead them on the Mediterranean Sea, they were in the Libyan coast. Remember that? St I mean, starking footage, and these 21 men are all just getting lined up to be beheaded. And a lot of them seem to have a lot of peace. And you know what, 21 men, these were Coptic Christians, many of them truly looking to Jesus beyond whatever the traditions were at that moment, saying, wanting Jesus. And they were threatened. If they denied their faith, they'd be set free. They'd become Muslims. They refused to. And it backfired for ISIS because they filmed the beheading, which you don't see, you didn't see if you watched it on mainline news, of course. But many of them, as they were getting beheaded, professed Jesus as their Lord and said, Jesus. But there was one man there who was not from Egypt, these were migrant workers, by the way, that were kidnapped who were working in Libya. But there was a West African man that was among them, working with them when they were all kidnapped. He was not a Christian. But he died professing the Christian faith. He, saw, he became a Christian after they were all kidnapped, and he saw the example that they were in the face of this terror. It blew them away. It blew him away, I should say. And when they said, you need to deny your faith now, this West African man said, their God is my God. 
And he refused to recant his faith. He saw the examples that these guys were. Dads, I know this is Mother's Day, but I want it to be a great Mother's Day for the mothers here. And I know if there's a mother here and she has a husband here who's hearing me right now, the best way you could be a blessing to her and treat her with the honor you're called to treat her with, you're supposed to honor your wives, is to be the best example you could possibly be to your children, amen? To get in the wheelbarrow, show real faith, and die with the name of Jesus on your mouth, amen? Out of your, on your lips, amen? So we need to be real. Mothers need to protect their children from evil. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Just go ahead and look at verse 7. Very familiar verse. Uh, verses like this, there's four or five of them throughout the scriptures. In Proverbs, there's a few. In Psalms, Job, where we read, The fear of the Lord, verse 7, is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look at the next verse, though. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake what? Your mother's teaching. In other words, mothers that are godly are teaching their children to fear God. Amen? And that leads to knowledge and wisdom. Verse 9, indeed, they are graceful wreath to your head and ornaments on your neck. And my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. There are mothers that teach their children to be careful of what friends they choose. Don't let people choose you as your friend. Teach your children that. You need to make godly choices as who you're going to allow influence your life. Because many children have been destroyed by immoral kids who have led them into sexual perversion, led them into drug use, and led them into all kinds of things. I know. You know, I grew up in a family where we were all influenced and allowed these influence in our lives where most of us were led astray uh, by other evil kids, and then we became those evil kids too. Verse 11, if they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush innocent, uh, the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. And it sounds like gangs, right? We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall have uh, one purse, my son. Do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. This is the mother's teaching and the father's. For their feet run to evil and they, have, they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in the sight of any bird. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. Wow. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. Now look at 28 and 29. Here's the problem. They will call on me, but I will not answer in the end when it's too late. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not what? Choose the fear of the Lord. You need to show how beautiful the fear. The Bible speaks of the beauty of the fear of the Lord. I love the subject of fear of the Lord because it's beautiful. It's just reality. It's facing the reality that God is God and that he's radically made the universe and he is love, but he's also consuming fire. It's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of loving God because he's not evil, because he's holy and just and righteous and pure and good. But if we rebel against him and we try to be our own gods, he says he'll have no gods before him, amen? It's teaching your children that they need to be in awe of God. They need to recognize how radical and how wonderful and beautiful he is. Kids need that today because there's every care in the world being, you know, put in front of them to tempt them. They need to have a vision of something far more powerful, far, with much more grandeur. And there is something like that. His name is Jesus, amen? We need to teach them who Jesus is, who God is. He said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Oh, yeah, he is love. But that caricature of him by a pond and holding a little lamb, with long, sissified hair, you know. I, I have a hard time with, you know, I'm, if you're a guy with long hair, uh, get it cut a little bit, you know. But anyway, I used to have really long hair. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Uh, how long is that? I don't know. But if it's like three feet long, it's probably at least two and a half feet too long, I imagine, or so. Or two feet too long. I don't know. But I'm telling you right now, the sissified version of Jesus is what people see in pictures and everything else. Jesus was a man, Amen. He was the ultimate man, amen? And when John saw him there on, on, at a, on Patmos, he had eyes of fire, amen? And when he comes back, he'll come back with his mighty angels and flaming fire to destroy the wicked, it says. He's a powerful God. Teach him who he is so your children learn to love him, 
because he gave his life for them. And he has nail-scarred hands and feet because he's a real man who gave his life as a sacrifice for his spiritual bride. Amen? But he also is holy and to be feared. We need to teach our children who he is. Mothers, man, they protect their children from evil. I read about Mary Thomas. It's an interesting story in the Chicago Tribune. And uh, she was in Chicago's West Side neighborhood, famous West Side neighborhood. And, and uh, she, had, she was a single mother with nine kids. Nine kids. And she wanted to make sure she kept her children from evil. And Mary opened her front door when there were 25 street gang members from the no- notorious, uh, famous uh, Vice Lords gang because the kids weren't allowed out to run with the other kids, gangsters. And they were recruiting them, and they wanted the kids to come out. 25 of them. And she said, give me a moment. She went in, and she came out with her shotgun. So there's only one gang around here, and that is the Thomas gang. The kids never came back. Mary Thomas ushered each of her nine gang members, the Thomas gang, into the home. She had a son. His name's Isaiah Thomas. Became a famous, one of the best basketball players ever. Hall of Famer. Another Isaiah Thomas on the Celtics that was named after him. Well, it's kind of funny how that happened. That's a whole other story. He said on ESPN when Mary Thomas had passed at the age of 87, uh, I told an ESPN reporter, my mom was very simple and very humble, and she loved helping people. On her dresser in her bedroom, she has a saying, what's done in life soon will pass. What's done with love will always last. Isn't that beautiful? And that had an impact on her, and he talked about how he always remembers that, and I felt like most, the most loved person in the world, he said, and I'm going to miss that. He knew she loved him. Amen? Mothers, make sure your children know You love them. They shouldn't even have to wonder about that. They shouldn't have to doubt that, you know. I know you can ask any of my kids if I love them, and they won't hesitate, you know, unless I really, in the middle of discipline, and they wonder, you know. Even my grandchildren. I mean, I always play that game, you know. You know, little little Justice, two-year-old, he always says, I love you too much, Pop-Pop, you know. And he got that from a game his parents, Holly and Chad, play for him. You know, I love you, how much you love me. And we play the same with our kids and with our grandchildren. You always let them know you love. Not just in word, though, right? You're always there for them, you know? I love it when Eli comes up afterwards and he just gives me this big bear hug and he clings me for like 20 seconds. Not every Sunday, but a lot of Sundays. And it just feels so good, you know? And, and Justice does the same thing. And he'll stick his head on his forehead on my head. It's just, mm, you know? <laughs> Jojo does the same thing still. No, no, Jojo doesn't do that. Changes, you know, you, know, you still love each other even more, but the way you manifest is a little different. But show your children that you love them. Amen, mothers, mothers, mothers love. There's nothing like a mother's love. Father's love, it's special too. But there's something about a mother's love that's just amazing. And mothers will raise their children and by the way, if you're not a mother and you're like hearing this message and you're like, I feel left out, you can still be a mother even if you don't have natural children. Amen? Some of the best mothers are mothers who have no natural children. And they adopt, you know, or they have foster children and, or they may have some of both or, or they may just simply be motherly to other people's kids and just show them righteousness. Amen? And show them love. I know Francesca... Uh, They've did, had a lot of foster children through the years, right? She's a great mother and, and adopted a couple of these children, going on more, you know, and uh, her and Greg, and it's beautiful, you know, and Ted and Pam. I was just spent some time with them because Ted had a serious surgery and was doing great even later, and there he is right there, just a little bit later. I mean, it was like massive heart surgery and stuff, and over 100 foster children they've had. That's crazy. I mean, well, it is crazy. It sounds crazy, you know? But it's awesome. And they told me it actually wasn't as hard as you might. I'm sure it was hard. But I think it's that love that carried them through. And how many other children do you have that were natural? Four. 
And they said they got along great. They were telling me how wonderful it was. And how did children go through that house they were at when I visited them? Wow. And don't think if you have three or four kids, you have too many. They had 104 plus, right? But if they never had those four natural kids, they just had foster children, they just had one, there's a mother, right? Or if you are a, a woman and you're teaching children in the things of the Lord and you're imparting that motherly instinct, you're being motherly to them, amen? Paul was not a father, did you know that? But he was a father. We don't read of him having children, but we read of him having many children. Go through the scriptures, he talks about he has children in the faith, amen? Bring children to Christ, amen? And then you become a mother that way. You become a father that way, amen? Paul said he's the father of many, truly. You know, I was reading about the cuckoo bird before. They're, they, they're kind of a trippy bird. They're a parasitical bird to where they're not good mothers. They will go give their chicks. They'll hatch their eggs in another mother's nest. And the other mother will come back and see this egg. And it's funny. You go to YouTube and look at cuckoo birds, and you'll see a mother, like you'll see maybe a robin or something, and she has these little chicks. But the cuckoo bird is so much bigger. And then she has a bird that's bigger than her, and she's just trying to keep it fed. And she's just loving that bird, even though her little birds are hard to get any food. And, but she's loving that kid anyway. And that kid, some of these birds are ugly when they're chicks. Just, you know, big and cross-eyed and just, ah. And they're like 10 times the size of her chicks and bigger than her. And she'll just do everything she can to feed that ugly chick. That's a mother's love, amen? Because some of us, myself included, were pretty ugly kids, man. I treated my mom in an ugly way at times. I remember, I was just thinking a while ago, a couple weeks ago, I was thinking, I felt really bad. I just remember raising my voice to her before, and most of us kids did at times before we knew Jesus, and you know, how she just endured that and kept loving us anyway. And that's a beautiful thing, a mother's love, amen? I, mothers are absolutely amazing. I read about Becky O'Connell, 65-year-old widower, temporary foster care worker. There was an article a couple years back in the Chicago Tribune. She keeps baby clothes arranged by size in the guest room. The hand-knit caps are stacked on the table near the door, and a white wicker bassinet is always within reach because she's gone through 77 foster kids where they're just babies that need help, and she's just, she lost her infant son in a car accident, and it left a big hole in her heart. And her husband died. But she found a way to be a mother by ministering. And they gave her the, the, the uh, infant whisperer nickname because she's so good with these kids. Everyone, every, every woman here should be showing their motherly instincts in, in ways that God calls them to as you seek him. Amen? O'Connell simply says, quote, My job is to fall in love with these babies. Not easy. It's not hard to do, you know, because God's put that in us. But you know what? It's tough. Your kids can get older. You can raise them to know the Lord. They can become backslidden and not know the Lord. And, but don't give up. Amen? Don't give up. In Isaiah, God says that he reared them up to be godly children, chapter 1, but they went astray. He's a perfect dad. The perfect father created Adam and Eve. They went astray. Okay? The prodigal son seemed like he had a godly father. He went astray, but he came back. Adam and Eve apparently came back. They both submitted to God, and we have a lot of examples of that in Scripture. But that's where prayer and intercession happen. Think of Jesus' brothers and sisters. He had four brothers that mentions by name and sisters, and it says his family didn't believe. In fact, they told him, if you are who you are, go up to the feast. You know, he said, my time is not yet. I mean, can you imagine growing up with a perfect kid that's literally perfect, your brother, your older brother? Absolutely perfect, right? Never missed taking out the trash or whatever it was. And there's already, and, and keep in mind, who is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament? Many, but one of those was Joseph, right? He was a special child that got special favor, and he was an exemplary in his holiness. What, what, how does other brothers treat him? They hated him, remember that? They sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him at one point. He's a picture of Jesus. Well, that's a picture of Jesus' brethren, by the way, guys. But guess what? Mary was a woman of prayer. Amen? Look at the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. She cries out to God, and she knows the scriptures, and she alludes to several scriptures in that prayer. 
But guess what happens? In time, Mary's sons come to Jesus. It happens on the day of Pentecost. You go to Acts chapter 1, and you will see his brothers were there with Mary at the, at when the church was empowered by the Holy Spirit. That trip. Don't give up. Amen? Don't give up. If your children are older, his, those boys were older because Jesus was 32, 33 when he got crucified. So these boys were in their 20s probably or just, you know, 31, 32. And they were there. J James saw the resurrected Christ. And James, when you read the book of Acts, dies a martyr for his faith because he saw his brother resurrected. Amen? He was a pastor. Jesus appointed pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He was a servant. Amen? But it took some time. But Mary didn't give up. And neither did Jesus. Amen? Jesus could say, you guys said I was mad, man. You never believed me. You're going to hell. Sorry. That wasn't his heart. Amen? He was happy to see them come to faith. Amen? Be like Mrs. Zebedee. Cry out. Get on your knees and cry out to Jesus for your children. Amen? A mother's prayer avails much, amen? Maybe that's why I should have named this message, but I want to talk about a lot of different things. And, but also understand that it's your father's desire that your children be saved. I read a statement by John Piper, very popular pastor. I don't agree with his Calvinism, but as a pastor, one of his sons went very far astray. And he wrote this, not in light of that son going astray, but he said, I have three sons. Every night after they are asleep, I turn on the hall light, open their bedroom door, and walk from bed to bed, laying my hands on them and praying. Often I move to tears of joy and longing. So he prays for them, and he talks about that. And he says, but I'm not ignorant a little bit later that God may not have chosen my sons for his sons. And though I think I would give my life for their salvation, if they should be lost to me, I would not rail against the Almighty. In other words, he may not have died for his sons, he thinks. Maybe God didn't choose them, even though I would choose them and give my life for them. Apparently, he thinks he has more love for his sons than God does, you know. He is God, I am but a man. The potter has absolute rights over the clay. My to bow before his impeachable character and believe that the judge of all the earth has ever and always does do right. He bows before his impeachable character after he impugns it, though I'm sorry, because he says that he may love his sons more than God does, and he would die for them, but maybe God didn't, but he wouldn't rail against God if he didn't. And it breaks my heart that people don't recognize that God's love is far greater than our love for our children, amen? And Jesus said of the children, let the little children come to me, for of such is what? The kingdom of God, amen? And Jesus says, for it's not the will of the Father that any of these children would perish. Amen? Amen? So the good news is that Jesus gave his life for our children. Amen? He wants them all to be saved. And you don't have to wonder if God loves your children as much as you do. In fact, to me, that's a, if it wasn't so sad, it'd be like a joke to even think that we could love our children more than God does. The Bible says Jesus tasted death for everyone. Amen? The good news is you have a good God and he loves you and he loves your children. He wants them saved. He simply calls us to be the fathers and mothers he's called us to be. Amen? But at the end of the day, we fall short. Amen? And we need forgiveness ourselves. And we need to get picked back up and go forward. Amen? And love our children the way God's called us to love them and the way he's loved us. Amen? But mothers, we're calling all moms. You are so needed, amen? Your children need to know who they are, what they were created to be, and where they're going, amen? And you need to play an integral, integral role to the destiny of your children. And when it's all said and done, they ultimately make the choices. You can't make the choice for them. But what you can do is make sure you're a godly example by just simply being the loving mother, the godly mother that God created to be, teaching them the scriptures. Don't leave it up to the church. 
oh, I wish the church would have taught my children more. No, it comes down to you in the end. The Bible doesn't say church, bring up their children for them. It says children, teach your, the Bible says parents, train up your children the way they should go, amen? The Bible says bring them up as parents in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Bible says train them up the way they should go, yes. The Bible says uh, children, or it says parents, to bring your children up in the instruction of the Lord. And it says, this is right, chapter 6, verse 1 of Ephesians. And it says, this is the first commandment with a promise. And it says, uh, and that's where it talks about they shall live well and have, have long life. Amen? It's a beautiful promise. But we just need to do it. Amen? And when all is said and done, you can put your head on your pillow at night and say, you know what? I want, I've shown them the faith that's in me. I'm in the wheelbarrow. Amen? I'm trusting Jesus. I hope they follow. All I can do is get in myself and say, come with me, amen? But you need to be doing that, amen? And you'll have a happy Mother's Day, amen? Praise God. Can we all please stand? Hey, fathers, don't forget what I've encouraged you to do. To give your wife a happy Mother's Day is be a godly man toward your kids and your wife, amen? Let's pass out the cup and the bread. So mothers, we need you. How many of you husbands say amen? We need the mothers, amen? Children, you need your moms, amen? How many children can say amen? Come on, a lot of you adults are still children. How many can say amen? Amen. Do me a favor. If there's a mother near you, give her, give her a hug. Tell her thank you for being a mom for Jesus, amen? Don't hug some other guy's wife and not yours. I mean, not you, know, you can hug a few people. <laughs> God is good, amen? Thank you guys for being moms. Hey, and guess what? You're bringing your children, you're teaching them Jesus, you're bringing them to church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. God uses churches to teach children, so the church does play a role. But the buck stops with you ultimately. And we do our best. We have a lot of godly people teaching your kids, and it's a beautiful thing, and many of you are among them. Take that seriously, too. I had Brother Eric Blackwell at the house yesterday, and Sarah, and, uh, not Sarah, but Camille was there with him, and, and uh, he had to leave, I think, 11.30 or so, 12. I go, he goes, I got to get home, because I got to teach tomorrow morning, teach the kids. So he's up there teaching, but I thought, praise God, he's taking that seriously, Amen. We need to teach, if you have an opportunity to teach the children, relish in that. Say, thank you, Jesus, and pray, and think about your study, and, and pray that God would use you, because that will help supplement bringing forth who God wants them to be. Amen? We've got the bread and cup almost passed out now. It's almost done. And uh, thank you, all, all you guys, uh, ushers and so forth, for helping out in that regard. But... Uh, Father God, we thank you for Jesus being the ultimate example who laid his life down for us, Father, who made mothers and fathers in his image before the world was. And the angels shouted for joy. The sons of God sang when he created the earth and that his plan was to create people in his image, male and female, to bring forth offspring and millions and then billions of children and many being redeemed for his kingdom forever. We thank you, Father, for sending your son, though we blew it such, in such a big way. He poured out his blood to pay for our sins, was buried and rose again to conquer the grave so we could have eternal life. We thank you for the bread, which is unleavened, just as he is without sin, which he said to partake in remembrance of his sinless offering on our behalf in Jesus' name. Father God, thank you for Jesus' a sacrifice. Father, your word says that the life is in the blood. We thank you, Father, that your son shed his blood, his life on the cross. So our impure blood, so we can be forgiven for our sins. Genetically, Father, even to one degree or another, we're disposed 
towards sin because of the human rebellion against you, but we're sinners by choice as well. We thank you, Father, that we're transformed, and though we were once sinners in rebellion, that we are now saints made in the likeness of your Son because of his glorious gospel and his shed blood. We partake of the cup with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Mothers, please, we thank you for being who you are in Jesus and for growing more and more like him. We want to encourage you, keep being those mothers that God called you to be because you're a tremendous blessing and you're an in, you play an integral role in God's kingdom and in millions of people coming to faith in Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Give God glory because he's good. Thank him for the mothers. Thank you, Lord. For awesome mothers, Father, we praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Massage your wives, if they're mothers especially, their arms. Because they're like octopuses, but they only have two arms. I mean, I watch Holly juggle her children, and she's such a fantastic mother. And, and uh, I watch mothers and just how amazing it is. But husbands, love your wives, amen? And treat, treat, treat them tenderly, and don't treat them with anger, but with love and affection, and amen? I'm going to keep going, but I'm going to stop. God bless you guys. Give someone a big hug. Love you guys.